But it now uh, gives me great pleasure to move on in the program to the second of our, our two keynote talks. And um, we're inviting Dr. Scott Hosking from Bass to, to give our, present our second talk. So Scott started off in environmental AI back in 2016 and um, with a few papers bringing novel digital methods into, into the research that was going on here at Bass. And, and 2018, Scott set up the, the AI lab, the, the renowned AI lab here, supported with a bit of funding from the Alan Turing Institute, the ATI. And then, in fact, uh, Scott, you joined the ATI in 2020 uh, with a, a secondment to sort of expand that group and, and build, the, build the links. And in um, February 22, Scott became the Bass Science Leader in AI and joined the Bass Science Executive. And uh, now I think Scott has 20, 20 colleagues reporting uh, across both institutes, including scientists, engineers, and community leaders. And um, obviously, we've, we've met some of those colleagues this, uh, this uh, in the last, last presentations this week. Uh, last month, Scott became the co-director for the, the £6 million Turing uh, Institute Research and Innovation Cluster in Digital Twins. It's hosted by the Alan Turing Institute, where Scott's going to expand the research activities and um, develop further spatial AI, spatiotemporal AI methods for environmental digital twins, which is such an exciting area. Uh, Scott, delighted to have you. I didn't have to come very far. <laughs> Thanks very much. We look forward to your talk. Over to you. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you, everyone, for coming and um, holding out. Uh, you know, the day two. Um, thank, welcome to, to Bass. I think we've said that already. Um, I, I wanted to mention that the building that you're in now was designed, or well, the architect was uh, designed it inspired by uh, a glacier. So on the way in, you'll see the, the hexagons and the, the, the shape, the angles. Also, if you look at the ceiling, this is inspired by the ice cores, the, the, the bubbles and the, the carbon dioxide trapped in the ice cores. So I, I thought I'd give you a bit of trivia to, to set the scene and where we are today. So Stephen mentioned uh, my background. I'm a climate scientist by background, but I've been moving in to uh, bringing in machine learning AI methods into, into BAS, into the group. And one thing we've done there is to stand up a cohort of machine learning AI experts. Rather than distribute them across the building, it makes sense to be to those people to be talking to each other day in, day out. Um, and I'm going to explain some of the work we're doing in that space. Um, just to help motivate things, this, this article came out in the MIT Technology Review just last week. Um, Eric Smith, who uh, you know, is a big name in, um, in Google and tech, um, has highlighted how AI will transform the way we do science and how science gets done. And the very first thing he kicks off with is, um, is this, uh, this paragraph focusing on the unprecedented heat waves, um, wildfires that we're experiencing right now, the flooding, you know, the, and the, 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 you know, the crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis that is facing our times, and how AI and digital twinning technology could support, you know, how, how we mitigate and adapt um, with, with our changing climate. In terms of what we're doing at BAS, that uh, connects to, to that so that idea, that vision, we're a highly multidisciplinary institute. We focus on the ocean circulation, biogeochemistry, glacial change, the, you know, the, the geology of the underlying continental shelf and the ground in We work with satellite uh, data. We, we fly drones. We've, we, you've seen our ship a number of times. Um, we, run, we have bases and manage those as well. Highly interdisciplinary. We have a space weather. We had an excellent talk yesterday in the solar project. Um, you know, we, we cover anything, everything up from space weather right down to the creepy crawlies on the ocean floor of benefit biology. So highly multidisciplinary. This makes it a really fertile, um, you know, group, if you like, to be running AI. Our, we have diverse data sets. A lot of those data sets should be interrelated with one another. They're all like measuring the same um, system, so there should be a lot of um, you know, correlation or uh, relationships between these variables. So the big question here is how do we combine these data sets together? And I like to see BAS as a really good playground, but you know, we put all the NERC centres and all the NERC labs and the environmental labs and university groups that you represent provide a really good playground for AI uh, and, and machine learning. This, the, the focus of this talk, I, I added the word spatial temporal modeling because I could talk about all sorts of things. So I thought, let's you know, 
let's provide some scope here. Spatial temporal modeling um, it, it is important throughout, you know, all the sciences that we've we've touched that we've touched on um, over the last couple of days. Spatial temporal modeling, um, how you know stuff moves in space and time, very difficult problem. You need to work at scale. And you know, if you're interested in extreme events, you really do need to, um, your models to be to be accurate and have robust uncertainty. A few of the areas that we're focusing on in this space includes the fusing of different sensors from satellite sensors down to surface sensors shown here on the left. We're fusing, uh, we're uh, working with fragmented data sets you know, due to clouds in satellite products or um, maybe one of our sensors is covered in snow. So we have gaps in our data and we need to, you know, to find ways to integrate fragmented data with more spatially complete data. And then often we need to increase the resolution or get to those granular scales, those impact scales. Um, you know, using super resolution or uh, downscaling methodologies. Here's one example again where we're, we need to get down to those local scales, but also we need to optimize our, our the way we do our science, the way we take uh, do sen um, we place our sensors, or the way we run future climate modeling experiments or ice sheet modeling experiments. So here's an example of our ice sheet model, the, the WAVI project here, which you know we're is part of our sea level rise um, uh, research here at the British Antarctic Survey. And often we run these models forward in time um, where let's say we're interested in sea level rise contribution. We might start with the current state and those, those models, those climate models or ice sheet models, they, they, um, they evolve in time. And ultimately what we need to know is what the uncertainty, what the predictions will look like at the other end on the time horizon that you're most interested in, let's say a hundred years or a few hundred years. Now, we cannot keep running these high resolution models, these cloud models um, indefinitely. They, they need to scale up. We need to find optimal ways to identify where we should run the next experiment. You know, what resolution, what physics should we be uh, set, you know, what physical constraints should we be putting in the model? To optimize that, that uncertainty to get the best robust uh, predict, uh, prediction window at, at the end. So this is again where AI is coming in and why spatial temporal modeling is, is, is a hugely difficult challenge but um, something we need to address head on. Another nice example here from a few people in our group and in MAGIC, the, the, the mapping group here we're working on is uh, sea ice and the iceberg product. So here we have three different satellite sensors We've got the pass away of microwave imagery down the left hand side, which um, the resolution is of six to 25 kilometers resolution. We then get down to an, another satellite sensor, the visible imagery down to 250 meter resolution, a daily temporal uh, and a daily temporal coverage, and then down to these you know, 40 or 80 meter resolution. Still trying to measure the same thing, but a much uh, finer resolution, 40 to 80 meters there. And one of the challenges now, we want to combine these different data sets together, these different products, uh, because they all have their own strengths and weaknesses, and we need to find ways to incorporate them all together. Um, yeah, just to, just to follow that um, with one more slide, we're also not only we're interested in the static imagery, but we also want to track changes over time. So, you know, Ben and others in our group, Ben Evans is here today, is looking at tracking of icebergs as it breaks off the continent. The icebergs provide a really you know, important um, uh, you know, metric of the, lo the loss of ice from the continent and what them, and, and you know, to help us project our sea level rise. But also we're interested in the, the makeup and the, of the sea ice and stuff like that. And you can see here, you know, when you get down to these really fine resolutions, you can see these ice flows, these blobs of ice, and we can use machine learning uh, and deep learning computer vision tools to segment uh, those ice flows. And again, that's hugely important for a number of reasons, which I'll just quickly go into before we launch into the main part of the talk. So why is sea ice so important? You know, you might think it's miles away. I've never seen it. Why do I care? Uh, it supports the native people and the wildlife and the communities that live it, across the Arctic and the wildlife uh, as well in, in Antarctica and the south in their fishing, hunting and uh, migration activities. It also drives the ocean currents and circulation as, as the ice, as the seawater freezes up, it rejects the salt into the ocean, which drives the, the circulation and uh, a lot of our climates as well around the planet. Um, the sea ice acts as a mirror, reflecting a lot of sunlight back to space. So as the sea ice reduces, the, the darker ocean absorbs that heat 
and warms up more quickly and also influences our weather even in the mid latitudes uh, as well. But also the sea ice is hugely important for navigating our ship and our autonomous vehicles, which is why we also spend a lot of time um, thinking about how sea ice is going to change what that means for our polar operations over the next few months or the next few seasons. And we've just launched our new strategy. And you know, just to show how important sea ice is, we've stuck it on the front cover. Um, it does, sea ice really does touch you know, pretty much all parts of the building and our biology, our polar operations, our climate, our ocean obviously. So it's a hugely you know, central component of what we do here at Bass. Stephen mentioned I also wear hats at the Alan Turing Institute. So as well as launching this strategy, you know, I was involved in helping to write this strategy. I've also been leading the Turing's uh, Environment Sustainability Grand Challenge, uh, their, their strategy in the space. And the areas that we're focusing on there is to automate biodiversity monitoring to, to enable nature recovery, uh, optimizing infrastructure for sustainable use of natural resources, uh, modeling interventions to achieve sustainable cities and regions for a net zero world. And then the one closer, I guess, to my background research, delivering localized environmental predictions to mitigate the impacts of climate change. And I wanted to highlight, you know, I do have these two hats. Um, Stephen mentioned I have a hat here at Bass and at the Turing, but I'm trying to merge them as, as much as possible uh, because there's only so many hours in the day and I don't want two jobs. So the idea is to really start finding ways to optimally work with, you know, these, these AI communities, the area groups and the funding that's available there and how we can also bring that into the, the, NERC, the NERC community and NERC system as well. One of our uh, sort of big highlights from the AI lab is this ICENET model, seasonal sea ice prediction system that we built a few years ago. Some of you may have heard it. Well, I, I pretty much mention it in every talk, so apologies if you have already heard this. But the idea here is that we, we want to predict how sea ice will change over the next few months or in, over the next season. We input multiple weather variables, winds, temperature, um, pressure, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the, no the novel aspect of this model is that we pre-trained this model on climate simulations. So climate simulations from the past and also up to the future up to 2100. So the model has seen something of you know, the, the different climates um, that we might experience, not just the, the satellite data uh, over, the, over the last few decades. And then we fine tune with our observations as well once we've done that, um, that pre-training. But the, the take home message of that project is that we could outperform a state of the art physics based model uh, on lead times, you know, forecasting ahead between two and six months. And we did this within 18 months. And, you know, the, the state of the art forecasting center, I won't name them here, but they, they've been working on this for decades. So, you know, it's a real game changer. AI, going back to Eric Smith's comment earlier, it really is a can be a game changing uh, time for, for the way we do environmental science. And also, I should say that this, now this is all trained, it takes 10 seconds to run on a laptop. So, you know, think about real time decision making. Uh, this is, this is, you know, clearly has, has, has advantages. So, once we've done that, we, produce, we wrote a paper, we have, we've, you know, loads of citations, it's been high, highly impactful. Um, let's think through this, um, the process by which we got there. So, we came up with an idea, we did the research, and then we wrote this paper. Now, the, historically, you might imagine, okay, so you've done this, and I go back to square one and, you know, write another research proposal, come up with a new idea. And we didn't want to do that. We really wanted to take this, you know, state-of-the-art CRS forecasting system out to market, if you like, to put it in the hands of the people that need it. So we are now working on a couple of projects, but this is one example, a project that Ellie Bell and our group is working on. It. Well, we're... You know, the, the caribou or the reindeer here rely on sea ice for their migration, for their, for their um, you know, the, the, the seasonal migration following the sea ice and, and the seasons. And what we've done is we have, we've got data where these caribou have been tracked. They've got collar data, GPS collars on them. And then we can track how they move in relation to the sea ice change. And we want to use that sea ice change to help understand and predict you know, the, the risk that this, uh, this community, this population um, you know, might be under in the next few months. So as you can see here, the sea ice is starting to freeze up. As you see more yellows and green colors, it's starting to freeze up. And when it reaches a certain level, you'll see these, the, the caribou start to make a dash for it across. So this is, you know, 
A, a really cool animation, but B, it will provide us now with some indication of what sea ice concentrations need to be reached. You know, what, what, how, how frozen does the, the, the water need to be before the caribou are confident enough to step on the ice and migrate across? And if we can predict <coughs> whether we're going to get a low sea ice season, that we can feed that information back uh, to, to the local, local conservation groups. And then also building, and this is something that James Byrne is working on uh, again at, at BAS, is the, is the way to alert uh, these communities. So we're working on mobile um, you know, communication tools to, to send out alerts to those who need it, again, to get the, the forecast and information to their hands of those that need it. So one, working with these groups has been fantastic and really eye-opening because one thing that we've you know, keep getting feedback on is that the resolution that we're working with is currently too coarse to make the kind of um, informative decisions that they need. So we're now working on a <clears throat> super resolution AI approach, a resolution variant approach to get down to the resolution needed for, for that caribou um, use case, but also some others that I'll mention in a moment as well. But yeah, we're looking at a four times increase in resolution or an eight times increase in resolution. So what I've just described there is we've monitored, we've observed the uh, physical environment, the physical system, and we're using that to understand the system and passing information back, passing data back to a digital model. Now that digital model might be the IceNet model, or it might be the ice sheet model, the, 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 the WAVI model that I mentioned earlier for CI lab contribution. But what we're also doing in this our group now is we're building digital models and we're passing that information back to, to the sensors or to the, to the ships with the autonomous vehicles. So I'll give a couple of examples of what we're doing in that space. <clears throat> so Antarctica is very difficult to get to highly hostile environments. We need to maximize, you know, when we go there, it costs millions to get there. When we go there, we want to make sure we're putting the right sensors in the ground at the right location. So one question we have here is where should we place our new sensors to maximize their usefulness and our understanding? And you know, we, we need to think about that when we put up our autonomous weather stations, but also where we fly our mobile sensors, our, you know, our drones and our underwater vehicles. So we've just published this paper, or it soon will be uh, published, but you can see the preprint online. Um, we've got this new project called Deep Sensor that Tom Anderson in my group is leading. And the idea here is, You've got your context points, you've got your locations, your sensors already, but you also provide some auxiliary information, which may be the, the elevation of your mountains or the slope, the angle, how close these stations are to the coastal regions, the, um, the, how, the, the context in which these locations sit with large pressure systems. All that information is required to then make, allow you to make a prediction at another location. We know that temperature drops off as you increase in height. So, you know, we need all the auxiliary information if we're going to fill in our gap, data gaps and make measurements at other locations. So this is the, for, for the geeks amongst you who like to see a, a, a network design, this is our, uh, our, our machine learning approach. And let's go back and let's show how we're using that in the real world. So we've got, th this is just an, a, a, a sort of a toy experiment, but on the bottom left here, we have some sensors already in Antarctica. These are temperature sensors. And as we go from left to right, we are adding on each time a new sensor. The sensor in red is the one that we're, include, we're adding on. And the, the, the shading here represents the reduction in uncertainty that that sensor has provided us with. And you'll notice that we've added a red dot here, and you might imagine that around that location, you do see a reduction in uncertainty. But there are other locations, like around here, where we've also reduced uncertainty as a result of adding that sensor. Because the, the climatology, the, the weather and the environment up here has some you know, link or um, similarity to what's happening down here. So now suddenly we're in this like, environment where if you're interested in one environment, you don't necessarily have to stick a sensor there. It may be cheaper to stick a sensor somewhere else in a very similar environment and then use AI to reduce your uncertainty across the continent. So as we go from left to right, we're adding more and more sensors. And, you know, this is the optimal way to monitor the whole continent, but with just four sensors. So this is our toy experiment here. But we're also now talking to CEH and Matt Fry and thinking how we also deploy this, make sure it's generalizable for other type sensors. So here for soil moisture, uh, we're also working with air quality sensors as well. 
So there's a really, you know, I, I see the polar examples are first case study, case study zero, but every, every time we build something, it needs to be generalizable and work beyond that one environment. Also for automation, so Maria Fox, who's here today, and uh, Johnny and others, and George here as well. I should, I've got to mention everyone now. And Michael's here as well, and James is involved as well. Um, hopefully I've not missed anyone, but we've got a team here, uh, quite a substantial team now building and using AI for automation. The question here is, what is the most fuel efficient route and task sequence to complete our science objectives? Again, we've got this net zero goal, to, by 2040, 2050, and um, running a ship is hugely carbon um, intensive, so how can we make the best of the assets we've got? We're not just talking about the ship, we also need to optimise the sensing and the, the autonomy of our um, drones, our underwater vehicles. And this is just a nice example I've taken from one of Johnny's slides that shows a battery optimised route between A and B, between Rothera and Stanley, the, this is a battery optimized glider, so the, the route that we will take, let's say going north, the, the blue line here, will be different to that coming south. And that's because we're benefiting from the, the ocean currents, the winds, the, um, you know, the, the environment that we're in. So we're not just going from A to B, we are gliding with and you know, taking advantage of the, of, of the environment as well. And again, that just shows how we can incorporate our sea ice prediction system as well. So, you know, we're, we're now also, as part of this project, need to forecast ahead in weeks and months ahead how the sea ice is going to change. And again, we can take that all into account when we, when we make these routes. So now going back to this um, idea of information feeding between the two, we now have a physical system and a digital system or a digital model. And we want to pass information in both directions. And at this point, you might argue that we are starting to develop something that you might call a digital twin, where under the you know correct time uh, time horizons that you're most interested in, your your physical system is pass is taking information maybe in real time or maybe you know that's passed on um, through a slower method, but but that's updated uh, with your digital model. So that that, that bidirectional um, flow you might call a digital twin, and we're not, of course, um, the only ones doing that as a massive project across Europe for Destination Earth with, uh, with ESA and ESA-WF and others who are building a digital twin, or well, their ambition is to build a digital twin over the next 10 years for the whole planet. That's to monitor, understand, simulate, simulate and anticipate uh, environmental change. Now with my Turing hat on, we are also spinning up a big digital twin effort here in the UK. Uh, digital, so this is a digital, uh, the Turing Research and Innovation Cluster of Digital Twins and BAS, um, you know, has, has a part in that now, but also a lot of other net centers we're starting to talk to others now to, to grow that activity. So our Antarctic Digital Twin in, will include, you know, over time, you know, um, Earth observation data, sensors, um, the ship, but also where, where this is somewhat different to what BAS would do on its own, is that we're now looking at the uh, how this underpinning technology can be generalized and work across different systems. So the Turing already has a, a digital twin of an underground farm, and they're building a digital twin of the heart and aircraft. And the idea is that we don't we need to stop duplicating. You know, when we build digital tech, if we can build something um, that, such as a spatial temporal model, we shouldn't just do it in the nerd community. We should also find ways to work more closely and make you know, and, and create higher impact with our, um, with our colleagues that are trying to do essentially the same thing, just in another domain. Um, the, the trick, the Digital Twin Centre was launched only in March, and actually the, the key highlight that the Turing Chief, uh, Chief Scientist um, demonstrated was our, the combination of our CIS forecasting system with our ship. So it, it is one of the um, you know, current good examples of how we're progressing towards a digital twin. Uh, and essentially it's the, the, the integration of you know, different digital systems together. This is only the integration of two systems, a, a sea ice system and, and a ship, when they're starting to think of you know, expanding that. And um, hopefully James will forgive me sharing this slide of his, a little old now, but we are integrating ice net there into you know, our, our ship um, 
digital infrastructure. We've got the SDA, the, 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 the sensor data ship itself, and the sensors. We have the digital version of that ship, whether you want to call it digital twin or not, it's up to you, but it's the digital um, uh, representation. And then on the left hand side, we have the digital twin of you know, the, 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 the environment at the end of Antarctica, which includes, I think, somewhere the ice sheet emulator as well that I mentioned earlier. So you can see that we start to do bring all those components together. And I'm just running out of time, so I'm going to finish now. So in the digital space, we're in a really interesting place to integrate and work across disciplines, across the biodiversity, climate, domain, infrastructure. And to leave you with this final thought um, from this, the conversation, uh, so Nobel Prizes most often go to researchers who defy specialization. Winners are creative thinkers and synthesize innovation from varied fields and hobbies. And I cannot think of a better community in the environmental space to do that than the nerd digital community. So I'm going to leave you with that. And I hope in 10 years I'm celebrating someone's Nobel Prize in this audience. You heard it here first. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much, Scott. Fascinating. Um, please, questions into Slido. We will start off with a question from Michael. Uh, Scott, could you comment, please, on how well understood the positive feedbacks and negative feedbacks are of some of the natural systems that you're monitoring? So the feedbacks, positive and negative. Um, so I'm not sure I entirely understand the feedbacks between what so is just so, so the sorry. The ice sheet reducing, reflecting less heat back, the heat of the ocean warming up more, the more ice sheet melts, versus like increased cloud cover, shielding more of the sun's radiation. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, I mean, this, these are big open science questions that we've been tackling for a long time. I mean, clouds, for instance, the weather increase in cloud will have a positive or negative uh, impact on a Earth's um, temperature, you know, is still up for debate. The uncertainties are still large. I guess the the advantage of taking a digital approach is that we can start to plug those uncertainties a little better. So if we need more information um, over space or time, or if we need to increase the resolution, temporal resolution of our data in certain locations to understand the physics, let's say, of the cloud or of the sea ice, which are so important for for those feedbacks, then that's where I think digital and automation can have a, a really important role. Very good. Um, I get to ask you a question now as well. <laughs> I'm just interested from a, a sort of general point and for learning, a little learning point for everyone here really, is just AI has expanded the, the scope and the ambition and the scale of, of the sort of science that you're doing. I wonder if you could try to sort of characterize what what the what the advantages of AI are to the yeah. general science? And yeah, uh, no, that's an interesting point. So I I always say to our scientists here, AI is not here to replace what we do, but to get to to do the stuff that takes too much of your time. Like you know, the, you all seen these pie charts where eighty percent of a data analyst's time is tidying up the data. Now, it, taking a fair approach to your data and automation can get hopefully a lot of that will just disappear or will, will be reduced over time um so i think ai could allow scientists to spend more time doing science you know that's you know i was trained to be a scientist to do science not to clean up data sets um i think also you know one thing we learned in the in, in covid in the lockdown was the the speed at which we need to make decisions so you know we couldn't wait for months to understand when we should be locking things down or you know when we should shut down schools etc we need instantaneous um answers to things and as long as you quantify the uncertainty how confident you are in uncertainty so that's fine and i think again a digital twin approach can provide that instantaneous response which may not be the most accurate response you might get if you went to a you know traditional climate model simulation but it might be good enough and I think ministers, you know, more and more in the future are going to ask or, or going to require very quick, instantaneous um, answers when they have questions. Scott, yeah, Scott, I think you, you possibly answered the, 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 the sort of the next and last quick question, which is um, just we, this conference has identified four, four themes of the next generation sensing, data science, tools and techniques, the way we collect and govern environmental data we've heard about the PDC this morning. And then lastly, the whole area of confidence and trust and, and skills. 
how do we bring all of this together into a package of, of contemporary modern science? What's, what's your take on? on yeah, typical. I, th I think we still, I think in-person meetings like this are so important to keep those you know, communications going. And we did, we lost a bit of that again over, you know, the lockdown period. So I'd like to see that this community keeps working together, keeps finding ways to hack on data together, identify, like I mentioned earlier, the, the digital twin of the heart and the, the aircraft and the, and the underground farm. Actually, when you sit down with them, you realize you've all got the same problems. You might use different words for the problems or you have different timescales that you're interested in, that we're interested in sea level rise over millennia. They're interested in crop growth over a season. But actually when you distill it down, to the data challenge. Actually, there's a lot of overlap. So I think almost certainly within NERC and with the EPSSC, we've been funding the same thing multiple times. And one thing I'd like to do is to keep those conversations going and find out ways we can work on larger, more open source projects and you know, for us all to work together rather than working in silo. Scott, there's a lot of insight there. Thank you very much for your presentation.